again, that's kind of whenever she found out uh, through the videos and stuff like that. Now, she does, how she told me she found out, I'm not sure exactly is, if this is it, but she went and got a new phone. It was logged into my Google Cloud because we had yeah. been logged into each other's email, and that allowed her to see everything. And I'm like, again, I'm kind of freaky. So I was recording a lot of stuff. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I was just recording a lot of stuff. I like to see it or whatever. I like that better than porn, you know, to TMI. But yeah, you say you like to see yourself. I like to see myself. I'm inspired by me in that regard. So um, <laughs> she saw all of that. And regardless of how she found it, man, I just was like, it's like, what the F am I thinking? She's pregnant. And she had to see that. Love is a treasure chest, but once opened, our hearts become vulnerable. I, I went back to Vegas. It was this guy. He appeared as a friend. Sure enough, it led to infidelity. Alignment can't be ignored. We talked about certain topics as far as having kids. She didn't want to have kids. Um, and that was one of the red flags. And I know you desire marriage. So I think it's best you move on with your life. What you do, know, Lisa, what you do? I told him, okay. <laughs> she didn't ask me why. I knew several other women's bodies better than I knew my own. I've, I watched their videos of them having sex, so I would try to imitate that. No discussion is off limits. Dear Future Wifey Podcast brings healing. You inspire us to try God a little bit more. Up and through this platform, I have realized that it's possible. It's possible to love again. The conversations have really helped me to change my perspective on relationships. Season 7 is all about tough topics. I'm Lateris R. Winfield, and welcome to the Dear Future Wifey Podcast. Welcome to the Dear Future Wifey Podcast. I'm your host, Lateris R. Winfield. Listen, are you still shacking up with us? If you're still shacking up with us, come on, can we get a commitment? Hit that subscription button and subscribe. Make sure you turn on your notification bell so you'll be notified about upcoming episodes. Listen, if you're listening to us on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Anchor, wherever you consume your audio podcast, make sure that you rate this video and leave a comment. That's how people hear about us. Thank y'all so much for making a Dear Future Wifey podcast consistently top 10 in relationships on Apple Podcasts. I thank y'all so much. Um, today's episode, as we talk about tough topics in season seven, uh, this is a person y'all been wanting to have on the podcast. Um, this brother needs no introduction. We're going to jump right on into it. This will be a two-part series. Uh, I'll run both of them consecutively one day after the next. So without further ado, welcome to a Dear Future Wifey podcast. My new homie, Derek Jackson. What's going on, brother? Derek, listen, man, people been saying, when are you going to come on the podcast? When I'm going to come on any podcast up until recently. <laughs> <laughs> so what made you uh, what made you decide to go do it? Um, I'm not really big on coming and doing interviews and talking about myself, but this one is a little bit different because it involves, you know, things that kind of hit closer to home. So um, I felt like I could contribute something to the conversation. If it's going to be had, I think it's best if it's had with both sides of the story, you know, and, and one day whenever my children do see right. mommy and daddy talking about this, I, I want them to see where we both stand and hopefully how we both resolve things. So that was it, man. You say mommy and daddy. So your uh, ex-wife or current wife, I know y'all going through whatever y'all going through. Mm. Um, Danea was on the podcast. Um a lot of times people, when I did the episode, I was laughing a lot on the episode. She has this funny wit. She has mm. this, this, I say it, this little Seinfeld humor. Yeah. Um, was that something that attracted you to her at the very beginning? Yeah, she had a sense of humor since the beginning, man. You really? wouldn't think it because she's kind of an introvert. Right. So she don't, she doesn't feel comfortable talking to new people often. At least she didn't. Or in big groups, but like once she gets comfortable or when she feels like she can trust you, she opens up and she's hilarious. <laughs> and, so, and so that's what happened in my pre-interview with her. I was talking to her. I was like, this girl is hilarious. This girl is funny. <laughs> so we did, did on the episode. A lot of people's like, they're talking about serious stuff and they're laughing about it. Why are they? And, and, and she was like, Latarius, if you weren't laughing, I wouldn't have been able to do no two and a half hours of an mm. interview with you. It'd have been too heavy. I like the fact that you got my humor. And I said, I bet you that's something that Derek found attractive in her at the yeah. very beginning. Among other things, man. Yeah. So we say other things like what? Man, first off, when I first saw her, all I knew is what she looked like. You right. Know? So pretty face, nice shape, all that stuff. Um, but I like that she was kind of like me in, in terms of like when you look at her, she's not the stereotypical thick cute black girl, at least, right. you know, this at 19 years old. Right. Um, and when people looked at me, they, they felt like, oh, you know, he's a jock. And, you know, I think you said that in the interview, matter of yeah, fact, which is yeah. not bad. But, you know, at the time I was fighting a lot and stuff like that. 
But you said you were fighting a lot. Yeah, man. I was just, you know, knucklehead, man. He's 19 years old. <laughs> but be, beyond the surface, though, you know, I'm a lover. I'm kind of soft. I like R&B music. I read romance novels at this point. I write poetry. You was doing that at 19? 19 years old, man. So, like, that version of me that's like, okay, it's not what you see is not necessarily what you get. It's the exact same thing with her. You know, she's not stereotypical. She's like Taekwondo and, you know, Justin Timberlake and stuff you wouldn't necessarily think, man. But all of that is what drew me to her. It's like my authentic self just felt safe and at home with her. How do you feel today? I want to check on you as a man. How do you feel as a man? I feel really good, man. Better every day. But I feel like it's a lot of gratitude these days. A lot of people wouldn't be able to identify with what you may go through on an emotional standpoint, especially have created a platform as large as you, you know, as large as you created mm -hmm. and then feel the world turn on you. How did you internalize that? Um, honestly, man, being everybody's favorite ain't really been my portion my whole career. I mean, at, at some point, I mean, now it's more legitimate because it's some, behind something I actually did. But in the very beginning, I knew pe pissing some people, I'm trying to talk no, crazy, no. pissing some people off was yeah. going to be a price I was going to have to pay. You knew that at the very beginning. Very beginning. And then, you know, before all of this, there was some like false rumors. At one point, people thought Danae was white because <laughs> I, I showed a picture uh, briefly. I, I posted my baby girl, my, my first daughter, Marley, and her hand was wrapped around my finger and it was so light skinned. They said, oh, he only dates white women. And I lost followers. I'm talking about it was going viral, all the YouTubers. So uh, honestly, man, since then, I already knew like, okay, people online, they're going to have their thoughts or what have you, and you can't see yourself through that lens. So I really haven't internalized that so much. A lot of times people, um, I saw my brother, Willie Moore Jr., he uh, posted a snippet of you um, about the interview that you were doing with him. Mm -hmm. that, that's When this dropped, that would have dropped three days ago. And I read the comments. It was like, why are you giving this brother a platform? Why would you do this? And all this type of stuff. Yeah. And first, when I read it, I was like, ah, now if I do this interview with them, are they going to feel the same way? I was like, no, like you said, it's a more balanced approach. I had Danae on here. It's only fair to have you on here as well, but not even on that. But even in 2020, you checked your DMs. I reached out to you before all this stuff started imploding. One of the few. Yeah, and I reached out to you because I always want to have conversations with black men because in the... Um, from your platform standpoint, the stuff that you were telling and 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 helping black women with was facts. You, yeah. It was no lies told. Yeah. What a lot of men took uh, gripe about is that they like, oh, not only are you telling the secrets or whatever, but they kind of felt like you were pandering to, mm -hmm. to black women for your benefit. What would you say about that? Well, we kind of have this bro code and it's got us in the chokehold. You know, and the bro code is all about having a man's side no matter what. Yeah. No matter if we wrong or what have you. And I think personally it's, it's created a generation of coddled men that can't take correction from anybody, no matter how soft it is or balanced it is. So when I'm saying all of this, um, you know, of course there's different layers to it. Some of them think, oh, it's because he wants a uh, vagina, because he wants money or what have you. But man, I was raised by a single mother around two sisters. Naturally, I lean towards the woman's point of view on things. Anything else would be disingenuous. And yeah. it's not that everything that I'm saying is necessarily right, but it's how I see things. And then if you take from that, just say, you know, your interview with Danae, you were, you were speaking in a way that was protective as her brother, you know, empathetic. Um, you was calling wrong, wrong. That wasn't you pandering. Right. You right, know, you like right. per the situation that you speaking on, this is the truth. Right. But whenever you're telling the truth that makes people uncomfortable or a truth that's not popular, they're going to look for a way to attack you either way or go. I can respect that. Um, I asked you, I said, Derek, if you were given the opportunity to name this episode, mm -hmm. what would you name it? And what did you say? Reap what you sow. Why? Why did you say that? I think whenever I've talked about these different rules and what have you, some people take from it like, okay, he's promoting perfection. We're going to mess up sometime. And my whole MO has been like, okay, if you're going to mess up, you just got to understand that come with consequences. You reap what you sow. Even whenever I started mentioning God, I gave my life to Christ February 4th, 2020. And people were like, oh, you can't bring God into it. I'm like, the God I serve says you reap what you sow. And I'm no exception. You know, even as I'm saying it, I'm living it too. Yeah. You know, and that goes both good and bad. But, you know, I think if we're all aware of that, we can walk according to that instead of thinking we get it out because we had our intentions or what have you. Um, for the time I spent in my patterns and the things that I'm not proud of, I gave myself an out. I gave myself excuses. Well, I felt like this and she did that. And I wasn't operating according to where you reap what you sow. Yeah. Not yeah. was sown by your partner, not was sown by the circumstances. And your daddy wasn't there. 
So um, if I'm going to talk about it, I'm going to really be real. We got to speak with that at the core of the message. I respect that. Let's go back. I want to go back to find out who Derek was. Who was Derek growing up? Like you said, I hear you just mentioned that you grew up in a single parent home raised by a mother around mm-hmm. sisters. What did that look like growing up? And why wasn't your dad present? So my daddy just got in a lot of trouble. You know, uh, my mama and daddy was in their early 30s, about my age now. So um, he's from Jamaica. He had got into some trouble, got deported um, very early on, actually when I was four years old. But he wasn't in my life since probably age one. Hmm. So my mama, coming from um, somewhat of a background that she didn't want us to be a part of, she moved down to Alabama. Me, my two sisters, and actually my older brother, but he was so much older, he moved out pretty quickly. And man, I just grew up, it wasn't objectively bad, but the story I created from the dynamic of not only daddy not being there and not having answers, but my mama working two to three jobs year round, um, I just felt invisible, you know? Cause like, again, I was really living with my two sisters. And they connected to each other a lot better than they did me. Yeah. Everybody loved me, to be yeah. real with you. My mama loved me and they loved me. But then when mama get home from work, she need time just to be a human being. She got her own battles. So as she's trying to give herself, she's really stretched thin. And then on top of that, again, she barely connects with me. I'm missing my daddy. So a lot of my childhood, man, was just feeling invisible, feeling somewhat abandoned. Even though objectively that wasn't what was going on, that was a story I had created. And then I acted out to get a lot of attention. How'd you act out? Uh, school. I was I was the knucklehead that made it really hard to find a babysitter. You know, they just knew that Bud was my childhood name. Bud gonna act up. Bud don't like to listen. Bud just needed some attention. And Bud knew it. The world is gonna stop if I if I get in trouble. If I talk too much. If I get out my seat. If I do this, that, and that. So I got whoopings and all that stuff. But it was really my way of getting attention. So that was pretty much my childhood. Again, my mama, a single mom. She made everything stretch how they needed to. She taught me basically everything up until I got to tenth grade. And that's when I had my stepdaddy, Mr. Lloyd, rest in peace. He uh, came into the picture and he gave me kind of that blue collar work ethic thing. You know, we roofing, we fixing cars, we cutting grass. So yeah. that's pretty much it, man. Did you have did you have any sexual experiences at a young age? No, no, no ne- never before my first like losing my virginity at like 16. About 16. Mm-hmm. So same as me, lost my virginity at 16. Uh, when you lost your virginity at 16, what did that teach you as a man? Was that something that your homeboys was encouraging everybody in the neighborhood? What city did you grow up in? Enterprise, Alabama. Well, between Elba and Enterprise, Alabama. Enterprise, Alabama. Um, shout out to Alabama <laughs> right now. You know what I'm saying? We ripping kind of hard. The Montgomery Molly Wild representing. Uh, but Montgomery in, Molly Wild. Enterprise, Alabama. Yeah. And so at 16, you end up giving up your virginity. What was that like? What did that teach you? Um, that when a girl say, come see my hair at one in the morning, it probably ended to come see your hair. Um, <laughs> to my, it was to my next door neighbor, and I don't want to go into detail about it, but... Um, honestly, bro, I was just happy to be having sex. I ain't gonna lie to you. Yep, yep. It just felt like a rite of passage, yep. you know, because at 15, 16 years old, you still trying to define yourself, be accepted. Yep. So this whole time, I wasn't necessarily tripping on sex, but when it came, I wanted to perform. Yep, yep. And I went in, you know, develop, but the, the, real, the reality of how I developed my relationship with sex actually started probably with pornography. That was about 10, 11 years old. Who introduced you to that? Uh, I don't want to say his name, but my homeboy. It was a homeboy. Back in, back in Elba, Alabama, he introduced me. Matter of fact, I think they were just introducing computers into the school. I'm old. <laughs> just introducing computers. So this yeah. is before they had firewall and all that stuff. And yeah. man, he told me to go on a website and I went on the website. And from there, man, I kind of, I, I won't say addicted, but I was definitely introduced to something way too early. What did that, what do you remember that doing? Because a lot of people don't understand how pornography shapes uh, the viewpoint of how men see or objectify women. Yeah. And and I had a conversation with, you know, even my sons, you yeah, know what yeah, I'm saying? Yeah. They be online, they'll end up something to pop up on these games and stuff. And yeah. I was like, hey, 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 this, this is why you shouldn't do this. Yeah. No one ever had that conversation with me as, as a young man. Um, and my, I had a family member that had magazines, you know, and I seen them a couple of times when I was like 12, but I just never did like get in, involved in it. So my question to you is how did that shape when you look back hindsight being 2020, how did that shape your viewpoint on yeah. uh, women? Well, what my therapist taught me was that it actually just created a toxic relationship with sex period. It became kind of a, an escape, you know, something to immediately distract me, uh, make me feel less rejected if I ever felt that. So, you know, starting there, of course, it rewires your brain. It desensitizes you and stuff like that. It also miseducates you on what real intimacy is. So it took me well into my adulthood, actually, until, you know, I was married. 
to understand that it's not about performance based, you know, whenever you're having sex with a woman, it's connection based. So I went, you know, even having sex in the earliest years, it was about, you know, the theatrics of what I could perform and so on and so forth, man. But um, especially if there's serious feelings involved, you may leave a woman feeling like a piece of meat when she can tell you wasn't even there with her. Right. So um, not only that, in the times where I wasn't having sex, again, that was my easy out. Like, okay, I I know I got porn, you know, I got this, that, and the other. And I wasn't on there like four hours a day or nothing like that. But I developed some nasty habits of when I'm really, really stressed or hurt or grieving or whatever. Yep. I can do this and then go to sleep or I can do this to get my mind. I can break the pattern by doing this. So that was pretty much it, man. You're in college. You go to college. Um, How did you meet Denea. Math class. Um, she walked in. Then she had on a black colored button up with black slacks. Um, pretty face, slanted eyes, nice curves. So honestly, it was all physical when I first looked at her. And then I saw her notebook and I saw that she was into music. And I was like, oh, I thought she was like a bottle girl or something like that. You know what I'm saying? Girl? No, I was like, I saw the saxophone and stuff like that. So I asked about it. And um, she had a really soft voice, somewhat of an innocence about her. Um, and we got to talking. I got a number. She uh, didn't immediately answer later on whenever I called. I think I called three times. I said, she don't answer this time. She answered on the last ring. And from there, man, we talked through the night. We did all of the stuff that we think about in high school and college, like yep. on the phone overnight. We were inseparable, man, for like that first two months. Um, just again, people look at me and looked at me a certain way, and I, I was misunderstood. But with her, even being goofy and bubbly, like my, my personality is naturally very, I'm usually the jokester. Okay. Um, so between that, and I, I had an interest that most guys would think is soft. Again, I love Terry McMillan and Air Jerome Dickey books. I, I love R&B. I, list, I work out to R&B to this day. <laughs> so I work you know out what I'm saying? On the, back, on the way home from, from football games, I was writing poetry. Coincidentally, Dear Future Wife post, man, back in the day. You can, oh, search, really? you can search on Twitter right now, put in hashtag <laughs> Dear Future Wife and Derrick Jackson. You'll see from 2010. I was on, so all of that soft stuff, she didn't judge me for, though. She loved it. She loved my poetry. She wrote poetry. And uh, one time, this is when I like knew it, like, oh, this is the one right here. I told her when I was younger, we loved peanut butter and jelly sandwiches. Didn't know that's how mama was making that money stretch, but I loved it. It was a delicacy yeah, to me. You better talk about it. She, uh, before practice one day, she was like, I need to see you. I was like, okay, for football practice. And she ran up to me with two sandwiches, one with white bread, one with wheat bread, and said, I didn't know which one you was going to like, but I know you like PB&J. Really? I called my mama on the way to practice. I said, mama, I found the one. Go on, get your dress ready. It's going down. Uh, this is at 19 years old, man. So we could joke. She we had them Skype. at peanut butter and jelly sandwich. Man, look, a sense of humor. Of course, she was sexy and all that stuff. But I'm she talking. Started off, she started off tutoring you, right? She said something about tu- tutoring you. That was a segue. You okay. know what I'm saying? I'm trying to figure out how to get close to her. First. Oh, so you used that? I as- used it. I ain't gonna lie to you. I used it. I need help. Now I did, but <laughs> that wasn't the reason why I chose her as my tutor. They had other tutors. You know what I'm saying? One girl, she had like a pimple by nose and stuff like that. I was cool <laughs> on that. I want this one right here. I want this one. And so, um, yeah, man, we continued to connect and talk and be inseparable and. You know, it wasn't. It didn't take long at all. I think within like a week and a half, two weeks, we were inseparable, holding hands everywhere. Went on dates. I ain't even had no money for a date. I ain't had no money to pay for my own food on a date. Um, and then the first night that I asked her, I think it was on Valentine's Day of 2020, I asked her if she would be my girl. We went on a, da- a bowling date. Not 2020. No, not 2020. Yeah. Shoot, 2009. Yeah. That, yeah. that year is so crazy to me. Yeah. 2009, February 14, 2009. I asked her to be my girl after a bowling date. She said yeah. And then I asked her to come with me down to the lake so we could pray. Over our relationship. It's the first time. Hold on. At 19, you're talking about you praying with us. I was actually a, you probably won't believe this. I was actually an average church goer, man, at that time. I was doing my stuff, but I also went down to Mount Olive Baptist Church down in Tuskegee and was front row every single Sunday. Really? Yes. Um, I was a devout church goer. The year before that, I had did a mission trip out in Atlanta ministering to the uh, homeless down by Peachtree. So, um, you know, she came in. I was still in church. You know what I'm saying? So I wanted to pray. I was so scared. You had to pray over y'all relationship. I didn't know what I was doing. I never felt anything like that. I never felt like I I really was in love because I had a hard time letting people close to me because I experienced a lot of loss. So I could engage. I'm an extrovert when it comes to meeting people and talking, but actually letting somebody in, she was the very first person outside of my family I had done that with. So, man, we prayed um, by the lake. I led the prayer. And then we was like, all right, God, I need your help because I don't know what I'm doing. You said you were afraid. Afraid. 
because you've never allowed yourself to open up like this with a woman before. You said you've experienced loss. When you say that, you're talking about what? Your father not being present. What are the losses that you incurred? Mostly my father, man. Um, and then my grandmother was a tough loss. And I learned really with that. And everybody lost somebody, but I learned with that I'm horrible at grieving. I, I don't do well with that. And I learned later on in therapy it's because of how I internalized my father's loss. I had so much meaning I put to it as far as like what that means for me. Like, I'm not worth calling. I'm not worth checking on. I'm not worth doing the right thing so you don't have to be taken from me. Yeah. Um, and then and then my mama, she had a thing that she would do from, from I'd say, up to about age seven, where she would tuck me in and say, good night, Mr. B, because Bud was my nickname. Um, and then mama got a boyfriend one time, and she stopped. And for me, I mean, it was dramatic, I guess, but I said, oh, she don't love me like that anymore. Right. So now I grow up and I'm really guarded. I'm really good at just going inward when I have something wrong with me, et cetera, not letting people get too close. Even girls are like, oh, I can smash. We could do whatever. We could talk, yeah. but I'm never going to give you my heart. Yeah. Um, but with Danae, none of them, none of them guards stayed up. So I was scared because I know like I'm feeling something I've never felt before and I don't want to mess this up. I know she's too good for me. So like, God, help me become somebody I'm not because I, I don't know what I'm doing here. So you, so during that time, you wasn't the type to be monogamous, was you? You just said I didn't have no relationship to be to be monogamous <laughs> in. I was doing my thing, like you know what I'm saying. Like, and, and so this one, you just said, why? Why'd you want to give it all up for her? I felt something with her I never felt before, but it was, it was emotionally based. Looking back at it now, it's like, man, I was so unprepared, and for something like that, you don't know how important that role is you and playing somebody life where you're going to give them your heart and they're going to give you theirs. Yeah. You hand somebody the keys to your sanity, your, yep. your physical health and so many other things. But we were taught later, you know, if you love somebody, you just go be there yep. and you trial and error. Yep. And there's a high price to pay for trial and error as we both learn. So as y'all were dating each other in college, what that looked like? Were y'all, were y'all, what, 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 Great, were you in at that time? I was a sophomore. Second year, she was a freshman. All right, so sophomore and freshman, second year, and you were like, this is my woman. Were you exclusive with her during that time? The first couple of months, I was exclusive. I don't know if I ever had the proper boundaries, um, but for me, it was like, you know, of course, don't cheat. Don't go sleep with another girl. But I would say after that honeymoon phase, the first two months is when I can remember. I don't remember the exact thing, but I remember feeling really rejected by her. And I didn't know what was behind that because, okay, I don't have aggressive energy towards a woman except in intimacy. And so how I would express my affection oftentimes was aggressive. Like I want to pick her up. Yeah. I don't just kiss her. I pin her up against the wall, put my hand around. I'm not trying to get graphic. Yeah. It's context here. So, I, you know, I'm come up behind her and hug on her, you know, kind of aggressive. But that would make her really, really shut down. And I didn't know what was going on. I felt rejected. Like, why you don't want to kiss me? My breast stink or something like that. So we would have, and not only would she shut down then, it would be tension. It would be almost hostile. So again, this wasn't until about a month and a half, two months in, where it was like, now it's back to back things. Now I come up on the kisser and she like kind of pushing away. She can't stay far enough away from me. She's kind of mean towards me. And it's kind of a flip side. Um, and I didn't know part of what I was feeling didn't have nothing to do with the relationship. It was much deeper. But I remember like, like, man, my breath getting short. I'm like, what is going on? Like, I ain't never been so sensitive to rejection because we all get rejected. But this is the first time I felt that. And what safer, what felt safer was to go out and at least have friendships with other girls. Just the conversation felt like receptiveness, like acceptance again. Mm -hmm. um, but those loose boundaries turned into no boundaries. So, you know, if we continued to clash and, cont and she continued to pull away or what have you, and I'm not getting no answers or whatever... I'm especially in my prideful state. I'm thinking, man, she got me effed up. So yep. I'm over here doing the right thing and she over here um, acting like I ain't nothing. So now there's a party tonight or there's a girl on campus and then she got her own dorm room. And that's whenever I started messing around. Which is interesting. Now I realize something. You were trying to be on the straight and narrow and that aggressive personality that you had, because she told me, well, she told us on the podcast that she had experienced a rape two weeks before y'all met. Yeah, so she, um, and that I want you didn't know nothing about it. I didn't know about that till five years later. Exactly. I don't know if she wants to speak on it, so I won't go in depth, but there was another instance of rape um, in that same 30-day span before she met me. So I didn't know to the, to the level or at all that I was dealing with a rape survivor. Even if I knew that, I probably wouldn't have known how exactly to handle, handle it. That, yeah. But certain forms, and we covered this later on in our marriage therapy, but 
because um, this can, this was a pattern. This, yeah. this everything that happened that was really painful was really one long repetitive pattern. Right. Me feeling rejected for this, that, and the other, and she handles you know becoming okay again a certain way. Um, but I didn't know certain forms of affection that were natural to me just felt scary to her, put her back in a certain space where, you know, certain things that happened. So, yeah. And that's, that's so interesting. It's like, I, I'm getting understanding. It's like you have this woman who has experienced this huge violation of her body, her soul, her spirit, this brokenness. She meets this guy who she says she just loved the mess. She loved your dirty draws. You're wanting to show your affection. You grabbing her, you grabbing her by her neck. You being aggressive physically, uh, you know, from a sexual standpoint, she's getting nervous. She's getting triggered on all levels. Don't even realize that she's being triggered like this. She's closing up rejection to you because you've experienced that growing up. Mom no longer is kissing you and tucking you in the bed at night. Rejection. So now you're like, well, now I'm going to go self-medicate. I have this history of looking at porn and now the way I self-medicate is watching this. So now I'm going to do the outward extension of that. Yeah. Now I'm over here hanging out with girls. One thing leads to another. Now you're over here smashing. Now it's triggering her. Once, How did she ever find out when you first cheated on her? Well, we were both triggering each other and didn't know it. Right. I was triggering her with my affection. She was triggering me exactly. by pushing away. Um, I didn't just continuously, because I had this weird thing, man, where I would do it and feel guilty. Would you like, tell? Man, I'm would tripping. You tell no, no, heck no. no okay, I'm no, 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 no. So I would do it and be like, oh, man, all right, you know, you messed up. You did your thing. Again, bro, we kids at this point. We 19, I know, so would the girls be old. running back to her? Nah, they didn't do that either. I don't even know if those particular girls knew we were together. Um, you bro, walked you, around holding hands on campus. Wasn't a, a, not open? all of them was on campus. Not oh, all of them was on okay, campus. Yeah, we talking. I'm, I'm trying to dig back because this is 15 years ago. A long time ago. Um, but I remember. I don't know how she knew. I, I don't think the original one or two or whatever she knew about. But I know we had a falling out um, because her and her friend. Uh, she suspected or something. Her and her friend used to have this thing on Facebook called Honesty Box. And it was where basically you send anonymous messages or whatever. So her and her friend had set up the semi anonymous messages to try to see if I would bite on the bait of another girl trying to flirt with me or something like that. I would have this, and it's again pattern. I'm cheating, now I'm faithful. Now I'm cheating, now I'm faithful. Um, so in this point, I was faithful. Yeah. You know, I'm like, oh, no more girls. I felt terrible. That ain't it. You know, we done made up or something like that. Somehow we get to talking and we back in love again. So this honesty box message is coming in. I'm like, nah, I'm good. Now nah, I got a girl. And then I'm hearing ding. In the other room, I'm at. We we got a, a apartment here, yeah. And I'm like, so I sent another message. Thing went into the room, her inboxes, and I'm like, oh, so we fell out. She suspected me of cheating at that point, but she she wasn't right about that, yeah. Um, and and then from there, man, it was kind of all downhill because we got into a really bad argument, and you know all this other stuff. Well, she looked. She said that in the times where she would ch uh, catch you back in college, she would never tell you anyway. She would go and go in the closet and cry, and then you'd come be like, "Hey, everything cool?" And then she'd be like, "Yeah, everything fine." Well, that was she, she'll say, "It's my dad. I'm, I'm grieving the loss of my dad." Yeah, that was a communication style. Period. Without cheating, I may say something that offended her. I learned later on in therapy with her that sometimes my my facial expressions while I'm listening would trigger her because I think her dad or something like had that going on. So a million things could be wrong with her, but then it again this dynamic of I'm asking, I'm begging for her to tell me what's wrong, and she don't. And I could take rejection maybe one or two days, but after two or three weeks or two or three months, now I'm starting to check out and detach without actually leaving. So it wasn't just the cheating that she wasn't talking about. She literally, if she had an issue, she held it in until she blew up. She said that. She said she's wanting, well, she held something in like 10 years and then blew up. A lot up. of stuff, man. It wasn't just that. It was a constant thing of, you know, communication is key, but you're not communicating. And so I'm over here begging, 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 trying, trying, trying. Because um, sometimes I'd be doing stuff and I wouldn't know it was bothering her. Like, yeah. one, like, so for instance, I was kind of a flirt. So I would say, hey, beautiful or whatever to a girl. Think nothing of it. But then she was, you hear that and be like, you call me beautiful. So understandably, she's offended. She's upset. Like, what, you know, you tripping. Like, don't play with me like that. But she don't say anything. So she wasn't vocal, but she was expressive. 
Because it ain't like she just didn't talk. She showed that she was upset, but it was with, again, rejection, hostility, name calling, walking off, middle of conversation. And that go on for weeks up until I pull away. Then she gets suspicious. One pattern over the next for the next however many years. So when y'all graduated high school, I mean, graduated go. college, what was the state of y'all relationship? Were y'all still oh, we together? had just broken up. So I found out about her and a gentleman. I think she mentioned on the last podcast. She said which, that she was trying to get you jealous or make you jealous about a coworker that that she said we we created this thing to make it look like this is somebody I was dating to make you jealous but <laughs> we we remember that differently um if i pick that cup up <laughs> and i pour with the contents in it in my mouth and i swallow did i make it look like i was drinking so yeah. my we've always differed on this by the way so i'm not yeah. trying to just stir nothing up um, no. So I had a nonprofit when I was in college. I wanted to tutor and mentor all this other stuff. So one of the things we did was we held events. I had a Christmas event that was like that previous December toward the end of college. And I had saw her and the gentleman, uh, the young guy speaking for like an hour. Now I've been to this point, the Naya had always like tried to kind of be perfect in my eyes. Like I think she thought if she ever showed a flaw, or whatever, I would just leave or something like that. So I was like, this is bold, you know, at my, my events, like hundreds of people in there, but I can see her just chatting it up. So from December all the way until we graduated that late May or something like that, I had seen the cars together. I had seen all these different things. Um, and and it's the coworker that she had. Yeah, yeah, a coworker, any classmate or something like that. So fast forward, and I'm thinking at this point, first off, we already coordinated where we're going to work after school. We're going to be in the same state, da 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 because I'm thinking like, yeah, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do this. But at this point, I think it was really a lot of what she had been holding in because I had been unfaithful. You know, I had cheated and all this other stuff. Um, I think she never fully expressed herself on how that affected her. So at this point, I think it started bubbling up to where she got really hostile. Like, man, if, I don't care what you say. So she's out overnight. It's like, I went to sleep at the gas station. I'm like, went to sleep at the gas station? Went out again overnight. Oh, y'all were, were staying together? We were staying together. Okay. We had started staying together. Like, we were shacking up like year two. <laughs> Um, so you said so she left the house and then come back the next morning to the, like nine ten in the morning in the morning, um, and this was unlike her. She was not this type of girl, but she's wearing makeup now. I know she got some hood rat friends from Sonic where she work, and she, I know she hanging with them. But I'm like, what is she doing? I'm not sure who's involved. So she did that two nights in a row. Um, then one night I came home. Um, I forget where I was at. I, I wasn't doing at this point. I wasn't doing anything. I get. I kept going up and down. Came home in the shower. I came in just like me, bro. I'm very affectionate. I'm, my, my number one love language is, is physical touch. So first thing I do is give my, my kiss and hug. She's in the shower. I go right up in there. And she while she's in the shower, she's wet. And she's like, and I'm like, what's up, baby? Kissed her. Came on out. And the phone is on the counter with the, with the messages up. And he's like, is he home? Can I slide? Da, 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 da. And I'm looking real quick and I see the name. She jumped out, wet, snatched the phone. And I was like, oh, boy. Went to the living room. I searched the name on Facebook, saw some stuff. And I was like, that's the guy that she was talking. So long story short, man, um, that was a big blow up. And we broke up. And then um, years later, I had heard from some people he was around about what actually took place. And that after we broke up, she had went and stayed the night and they did whatever they did. And it wasn't until we were married because we had this thing where, hey, tell every sexual experience you've ever had. Yep where we were married and she finally, after he done died a couple months earlier, said what all had actually transpired. So she admitted to it. And well, she did. She said, well, she didn't have sex while we were um, together, but it was afterwards. Me, I'm like, it, it pales in comparison to what I did. I am not going to get mad. Like, let's just yeah. keep it all the way G so we yeah. can sweep this away and get on to the next chapter. But we had the, the, the direct answers. We broke up. We yeah. broke up because of that. Um, her and whoever, I didn't care. I moved on, did my thing, but we stayed in touch. And when she moved to where she moved to, we, we kind of reconnected sexually. She said that at that point, well, first of all, let's go back to uh, her personality, which is interesting because I've come to find out that Naya said she used to be a fighter. She used to, she used to swing on people. She said <laughs> somebody came to that job one day, she done fought people. So she, she, she... <laughs> I didn't know that part of her, but I, I mean, she's spoken of being willing to, but I didn't know that part of yeah, her. Yeah, she said she she was known to throw hands, and I was like, really? <laughs> I was like, she was like, oh, yeah. Got a lot of tricks up her sleeve, a lot of surprises. <laughs> Box of hands. chocolates, man. <laughs> 
She said she threw hands. And so now y'all moved to y'all's uh, respective cities. What city was that? Was this uh, when you moved I was to Atlanta? In, I was in um, Rocky Mountain, North Carolina. No, this was, we went to North Carolina first. Okay. Well, and then she was in South Carolina. And y'all were both single during that stage? Very single. You doing your own thing, she doing her own thing. Her own thing. But then y'all would just smash every now and then. Every now and then. But then um, I would say, well, this lasts about a year and a half. So if she needed me, I came and like say, for instance, one time, I, I worked a nine to five at the time. Um, I was at work, but she had felt really ill and she didn't have no family down there or nothing like that. And um, I came back, I flew back and I just drove. It was like a five hour drive. I, st I drove down there. And I stayed with her that weekend. So anytime she needed me, you know, she handled furniture, I would help. If she needed to do this, I would help. That was kind of how we, you know what I'm saying, how we did things. But we were still sexually engaged whenever I did come. Would that be defined in today's standards as a situation? That's fair to say. Or, um, just, or just somebody I'm just smashing. Because you may, because a situationship is more so as, it's, and it's understood that we're exclusive with each other, but we don't have the title. This yeah, yeah. sounds like more of... I understand you got other people you messing with and mm -hmm. vice versa, mm -hmm. but you know, we'll hook up. I would up say after the first, probably the first year when we kind of really started up with, I'm coming in, I'm operating as a boyfriend or yeah. she's operating as a girlfriend, daily calls and texts and check-ins and stuff like that, but still undefined. Yeah. So, I mean, it's fair to say situationship. Either way, it was a blur line mess. And when y'all got ready to move to Atlanta, was that a conversation that y'all had that y'all were going to move together? First, she was going to come up to uh, where I was at in North Carolina uh, my whole goal was to get down to Atlanta. My whole life goal was to get down there and driving distance to my mom and them. Um, we were living in Atlanta? A Alabama. So she's okay. like a four hour, four hour drive away. So I never had plans of staying too far away. I always wanted to be close with family. Um, but yeah, we, we had that conversation. Like at some point, you know, especially as we get back together, we're going to be down in Atlanta together. So when at the birth of, uh, at what stage and age did the birth of the Derek Jackson that we see on social media, when did that emerge? Um, it kind of started, I would say about 2012. I didn't, well, I can't say social media because now I talk a lot about relationships. I didn't start off with relationships. What were you talking about? My, I was talking about police brutality. I was kind of like one of them online activists. Oh, really? My first time going viral, my first time on national television. I went on CNN. I was speaking on behalf of Walter Scott Bush. Uh, my first time going viral, it was about Trayvon Martin and Rachel Gentile and those folks. That's what you was doing? That was my first thing. I was That's the first thing I went viral with. So the first like fifty to 100,000 people that was on my page, and I only separated it because I didn't want people on my personal page aggravating, you know, how racist it is. Yeah, yeah. So um, yeah. I, I created a separate page where I was talking mostly about that. Occasionally, I was sprinkling in relationship stuff because I was always a lover. I always loved love and talking about love. But and that yeah, was 2012. Man, this was 2012. I 2011, 2012. Um, when I first went viral, I went to work and I saw like 15,000 people liking the page and so on and so forth. I ain't know nothing about it. Yeah. Um, but I was just speaking my piece on what I, whatever I felt was true. But then that became too heavy. It was like, it's so dark and, and, and it induces this helplessness. And I don't know how people do it now when they yeah. get up and talk about that every day. It's not that it's not important. But anyway, I was just like, I kind of want to stick to just the lovey-dovey stuff, man. So I kept posting my poetry and, you know, Dear Future Why, you know, yeah. um, and all that stuff. But people, like now I got like 75, 85,000 people are looking at my page. And now what they see is at least relationship conversation. And so then they would ask questions. And that's whenever, I don't even know what year that was. That had to be about cl closing on 2013 sometime. And I wasn't trying to give um, like this expert point of view. I was just more like big brother. You know what I'm saying? It's like, hey, this is what it is. I'm not no night white shining armor, but this is the truth on what you're talking about. And so they begin curating more of the conversation now, the DMs, the comments and stuff like that. And little by little, they started going viral. And so you you were intentional enough to say, let me leave this other stuff alone uh, and then focus my energy on love and relationships. Yeah, I honestly, bro, just like everybody else get on social media yeah. to post whatever's important to them, that's what I did. The only difference is my voice started resonating and relating to people. And I think I was probably a bit more bold than most. What was um, the style? Were you doing it? Was you on the cell phone like you've become known for? Or was, did you have cameras? Like, what, what were you doing during that time? It was written at first. It, it was, was written. all written. Everything was written up until 2014, 2015. Um, my first, actually, I was a romance novelist. The first couple of books were Cheating Man's Heart 1 and 2, inspired by, you know, I'm sure it's a huge surprise. <laughs> um, and then from there I wrote poetry because again, I'm just staying true. Some people were trying to push me into expert land. I'm like, y'all don't know. I just effed up everything. I ain't, I ain't the one. But, um, then when I got down to Atlanta, this is 2015 ish. We, me and her just broke up all over again. People have been stealing a lot of my content. 
And I was like, enough of that. So I started making videos, Snapchat videos. And then those went even more viral than the written stuff. So that's how that happened. It was on my cell phone. Um, I ain't have none of these beautiful lights and cameras or nothing like that. But I was able to impact a lot of lives, even just with a, I think it was an Android at that. You got, you got something against Android? I'm just saying, no, you know how everybody no, 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 be shady. Now you woke up and chose violence. Now I People got are Samsung phobic, so we, you know. We, we, we have here. a great conversation until you had to go attack Android. <laughs> now, now, interview over. I'm sitting uh, Triggered you. Yeah, yeah triggered me. <laughs> you, you iPhone people. And so you start doing this content. And so what kind, what kind of feedback did you get from your brothers? Like where, like dudes that you know, where they like, man, come on, man. What you doing talking about this stuff or this? Like your inner circle, how did they receive it? Um, my inner circle knows me. They know, first off, I'm kind of soft, like. I always liked things that most people didn't like. Okay. You know, I watched a little bit of sports, but not big on sports. I always like, I always loved love. Whenever we used to freestyle back in the day, I was always on love topics, all that kind of stuff. So, really? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But um, outside of my inner circle, you know, I got a lot of feedback. That, you, that really kind of got with the videos, the comments and all that kind of stuff. Oh, man. <laughs> but it's just like, bro, true is true. Like, again, like you just think yourself back in your, the worst of your decisions, whatever they may be, yeah. your female cousin, auntie, mama, sister come and ask you a question about a dude, you're going to keep it straight with them. 100%. You're not going to tell them, oh, he put his hands on you because you didn't have the food ready when he got home from work. You're going to say straight like, no, nah, he put his hands on you, but he probably wouldn't talk out of line to a dude the same size as him. 100%. Cowardly. Right. Yep. Yep. So that was the perspective. But as people came and piled in and again, I never branded myself because it wasn't about no brand. Um, I just wanted to do what I was doing full time. So I had well, to you wouldn't money. even know it at that point. You don't I'll know do, how this could grow. That was not a thing whenever I first started. Right. It was like maybe two guys, I, I think one or two guys that was doing it professionally. Who was doing that professionally? I want to say Tony Gaskin uh, was one of one of the ones. And then uh, a brother by the name of Stefan Speaks. Oh, yeah. They yeah. had a thing going on. And I still didn't know their business. So, I, I mean, you know, I didn't know this as a profession. But um, yeah, that was a, the, the, the feedback. But then guys that actually talked to me in real life, we always left the conversation, them understanding what I'm saying in full context. So if a woman asks you a question, you're going to speak to that context. Yep. But of course, it's a larger conversation in both sides of the coin. And how did, when did you start knowing that, when did it click? This can be monetized. This is, did, did it happen from your first booking that happened? Somebody said, hey, we want you to come speak at this women's thing about this. You're like, wow, I can get paid for this. How much y'all charge? $500? What did what, what I charge? Yeah. What was the first thing that made you say, I could get paid for doing what I love doing? I love, first off, I, I published my first book, 2013. It was a romance novel, though. It wasn't no advice, 2014, 2015. What was that called? A Cheap Man's Heart. Okay, so that's that's when you then the, created but, product. Yeah, yeah, but it was tough to sell because I didn't know how to, to show the value in it because I didn't have no quotes in it or nothing like that. Yeah. So then I was like, well, speaking, but I was deathly afraid of speaking. Really? I got booked for an hour, funny enough, in Molly Watt Montgomery, and I think it was about $400 that I got paid. Um, I had everything up in my mind, I'm going to say it, and I had everything out in 10 minutes. And I had another 50 minutes to go. I was sweating just like I am right now, except I ain't had nothing to say. So I was like, well, speaking probably ain't it. Um, and then I was like, from there, I had to figure out other ways to make money. So, you know, even to this day, my content ain't how I make a living. I have other businesses, but I had to figure out how do I do marketing? How do I do Google Analytics and Facebook and YouTube marketing? How do I do these other things? Because I'm not getting no money. At that time, they didn't have no monetization for nope. Facebook and all that stuff. Um, so if you didn't have a product to sell or if you weren't getting brand deals, you yeah. ain't making no money. Facts. Yeah. Did you ever get brand deals? Um, not like as a long term thing. I did a couple of things for like the last OG show and stuff like that. Yeah, but not like the way it is nowadays, where they'd be like, I didn't. I also I I stopped even accepting them because I felt like they would always try to control me. Like my thing is like I can't be bought. I don't care who like what I'm saying. I don't care the the feed man. Look, I'm gonna say the truth. I'm not gonna be a sellout. And a lot of times the brands would be like, oh, well, you know, you got to take this video down, especially about the black stuff, yep. pro-black stuff. And um, I'm like, I'm not taking anything down. Yep. If I say I love even black women, if I say I love black women, I'm adoring black women, I'm sorry to those whites and, and yep. non-blacks that get offended, but this is how I feel. So I stopped doing brand deals, and that's why I really learned business so I could be independent with my voice too. That's real. And so then when y'all, how did y'all, what initiated the move to Atlanta. You want to get closer to your mom, oh, mom. four hours drive, that, that y'all move together in solidarity that you say. We, we planned it first. Um, we planned it first. She had got a job down there. Um, by this time, I was a full-time entrepreneur. But then we broke up right before we even went down there. We were some making up and breaking up fools. 
So we went down there separately. She went to stay where she was at in Dunwoody. I forget where I stayed, Dallas, Georgia, something like that. Um, and yeah, we, this was just another long single season. We had three main tries at relationship, one in college, one right after college in North Carolina, and then the one in Atlanta. And so when you say the single season, how long? I know it's hard to look back at that time. How long were you single and y'all still, because y'all still never just stopped dealing with each other ever, No, right? no, 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 no. So y'all were, we're not official together, but we still going to be smashing, meeting up to smash. Uh, how long did that season last? Maybe about a year. I would say this was in, um, I think it was like the second half of 2015. And then we didn't get together and operate as a couple couple until uh, Marley was just about here. And that was in 2016, end of 2016. So yeah, she went and did her thing. And, and from my understanding, not just single, like we smashing, but she was on dates with other guys. Nothing wrong with that. And of course I was doing what I was doing. So is this her comedy when she says, me and the girl, she said, I knew, you know, I like having sex with them. We passing each other, me and women passing each other in the hallways. Is that comedy or for real? I don't know why she said that um, because I told her a story about two girls passing each other. There's no way in heck I would have her because I know her temper. <laughs> no, she and she saying, I never seen her fight, but I know her temper. She's yeah. going she to make stuff uncomfortable. No way I would have her around any other woman that I was actually smashing. Uh, but there was a situation I told her. So maybe I think as she was talking like us, as a, everybody who's, you know, sleeping with Derek. Um, but yeah, there were two girls that passed each other up on the staircase because I never lied. Like, this is what I'm on. Um, I'm single now. I'm in deep in my whole phase and I'm going to win all American honors in it. See, that's that's what I'm talking about. So if you can be 10 toes down and be honest like that, I can't do nothing but respect that because women say that that's what they desire. They like for a man to be straight up honest so they'll know how to move accordingly. Mm. And so you're telling me that in that phase, you were still you were straight up like which she said that it was like that. that There's no perceived relationship. There is none of that. Now, there could have been more etiquette. And how I did some of those things. How? Tell me how you have. Um, first off, you whore, know, whore I thought etiquette. that was I thought that was kind of messed up for the girls I had passing each other. Um, I really was in savage mode. And then I think one or two times the nail would see like some condom rappers or something like that. And I'm like, even though we're not together, she may be doing her thing. We know our history and we know the feelings that we got for each other. And especially whenever she got pregnant, you know, we conceived Marley. I think New Year's Eve or what have you, and going into 2016 and. You know, we continued engaging sexually, but she's pregnant now. And then I was still out here doing my thing with whoever, whenever I felt right. like it, because we were not together. Right. You know, and it was well understood. But um, again, that's kind of whenever she found out uh, through the videos and stuff like that. Now, she does, how she told me she found out, I'm not sure exactly is, if this is it, but she went and got a new phone. It was logged into my Google Cloud because we had yeah. been logged into each other's email. And that allowed her to see everything. And I'm like, again, I'm kind of freaky. So I was recording a lot of stuff. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I was just recording a lot of stuff. I like to see it or whatever. I like that better than porn, you know, to TMI. But you, know, you say you like to see yourself. I like to see myself. I'm inspired by me in that regard. So um, <laughs> she saw all of that. And regardless of how she found it, man, I just was like, it's like, what the F am I thinking? She's pregnant. And she had to see that. Single or not. She's pregnant, and she had to see that. Um, Hold on, let me ask you this, because this is something that she said on the podcast or before, whatever. She's been pregnant by you multiple times and, and didn't conceive, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. We, we didn't carry. Right, it but, didn't carry. Um, and so when you had Marley, that's the first child? Is that that was said? the first time we actually had. We had um, gotten pregnant prior to that in North Carolina, but she miscarried. But And then before that were abortions. Well, definitely. Uh um, you have my condolences totally. And so when you, what made you decide or y'all decide to give birth to Marley? Well, earlier in our years, we were just kids and we felt like we're, we're being irresponsible if we bring them in, you know, really thinking of ourselves at that time, not thinking about, you know, the God factor or anything like that. So by the time we got to North Carolina, it did take a toll on her, even those experiences. And, um, you know, for me, my whole stance was, even though we created this together, it's your body that has to carry it. So whatever you want, I'm on. Um, and in North Carolina, we wanted it, but she miscarried. So when Marley came about, it was like, oh, it's game time if we can actually carry. It, was, it really wasn't even much of a discussion. The moment, we weren't boyfriend and girlfriend, but the moment she let me know, I told her, you ain't got to do this alone. Like, I hope you know I'm all in. Um, and I was. Every doctor's visit, I didn't miss one. 
Um, I told her she didn't have to work and I was going to take on every bill and I did. So she didn't work from that point until all the way, honestly, until we divorced or I filed for divorce. But that was my whole mindset. You said all in was we're in a relationship at this point? Or no, when I mean all, all in, in I was I was still yeah, not thinking says, we could work in a relationship. Um, I but also you, had to really, be a present father. I, I'm, absolutely. Yeah. Because probably more than I wanted to be a husband, man, I wanted a family. I wanted to be a dad. Because that, of what you were lacking growing up. That was my major pain point. Yep. I don't have my daddy. And I remember vividly asking the questions to my mama. She's trying to answer best she can. Um, but feeling a way when I saw this and that, I'm like, one day when I get my baby boy, I'm not going to miss anything. Um, so when she told me that, I really got excited. But I also wanted her to know she had my full support regardless of our relationship status. So every gynecologist, I went to the, the little classes to teach you how to massage her while she on that Pilates ball. Yeah, yeah. I was just like, oh, it's game time. I bought books. Um, but we had not sealed up the relationship exactly. So some time passed. And I think we had a little argument where she was like, um, if you don't be with me or something like I'm that. I'm not going to let you see your kid. I'm going to take, take, take the baby off the grid. Yep. And it shook me. And I had to talk about that again because my mind is, oh, she would never do something like that. Yep. Um, but she was like, oh, she I was said, just she said, she said, I'm going to take the baby, move with my mom. Yeah, but she said, I'll, I'll be off the grid where you can never even reach me. And I was like, okay, I never heard that before. Um, but anyway, fast forward, it stuck with me even though she said, oh, I was just talking, I was just upset, you know, my pregnancy emotions. Um, but I also, whenever she had found all that stuff, the videos and stuff, I was just like, man, you got to tighten up. You can't be on this. I don't like the example I'm about to set. At this point, I'm in my career. I'm talking about family values. So I was like, all right, time to cut the whole phase short, time to lock in. Um, and I made my mind up like I'm going to propose to her. I'm going to give her some time to heal everything or whatever. But New Year's Eve, I planned it all out, started paying for the ring. I'm like, it's game time. Why? Why did you decide to marry her? What? What? Because at that point, was it led because of the pregnancy? Was it led out of true love for this woman? Is it led for, like, what initiated and made you say, this is my world that I'm in. I have this platform where I'm sharing this. Mm -hmm. I have this child coming, but I want to go ahead and marry this woman. Um, the platform impact was the least of it. With her in that time, even though she was pregnant, she actually was helping me with work a lot. Uh, my, my business was picking up, going crazy. You know, this is the first time. I think it was the first year I made seven figures. And I'm in my 20s or whatever. And I'm like, I can trust her. Yeah. She was with me when I was broke. You know, whatever, whatever. It didn't happen over the years. But at least I know she doesn't want me for my money. Yeah. And she's carrying my baby while helping me at work. Um, if we can make the relationship work, I want to try. And this time, knowing what I know, because now I'm teaching the masses, I'm like, I know how to. I know how I, I need to come. I need to secure her in terms of my intentions, and that's where the marriage part comes in. Yeah. So she knows I'm not playing no games. Um, I got now the financial pieces there, so she already ain't working. But soft before soft life was cool. I was like, I don't want her to have to worry about anything financially. Yep, she said I'm, that. She I'm said all that in. Financially, she was good. Yeah, financially because you know another pain point was I saw my mama struggling. And I always felt like if a man was here, she wouldn't be, you know, how she is, tired all the time and gone all the time. So two things I knew I wanted to do. I wanted to be a present father and I wanted to take some weight off of my lady's shoulders. Um, and from there, I was like, whatever. I think if I come in and I do my part, the rest is going to fall into place. But it don't work like that. Um, I see, and I, and I had to learn this in therapy, man. Like, as much as we know we cultivate a version of a woman, she exists outside of us. Oh, of course. Well, it's easy to say that, yeah. but then when you in it and you know that you're doing this, this, and this, because it wasn't just financial. Um, if she called me at any time, I don't care if she wanted me to run to a place and get her some food at one or two in the morning, it's like whatever. And I'm sitting there building that into, that's going to produce a certain version of her. But that mindset didn't allow her to experience remaining trust issues with me. Um, postpartum depression. Oh, yeah. All of these different things, that can, they ain't got nothing to do with how I'm treating her. Right. So without considering that, man, I personalized everything going into even the engagement and on forward, man. So, um, yeah, that was that was my thinking. Like, we're going to make this work no matter what, but we still had not properly set the foundation, reset it from all of the years past. And when you decide to marry her, you made up in your mind, I am done uh, with all these women, this is my wife. I'm going to be an honest man that that covers my wife properly. When I made up to just get engaged with her, I had burnt all the bridges. Oh, you did? But the thing was with me, my boundaries were loose at Explain. best. Because so people boundaries understand being, I had bad boundaries when I was married. So I just want to hear what you 
what, what, what you consider a bad boundary? So I may have a woman that I slept with before, um, even right. in our singleness. I may have a woman I have sexual history with before, and I have no problem carrying on small talk. That's one boundary. Right. Um, going out where I knew somebody else was going to be there, um, that's, a, that's a loose boundary. It's like you know somebody that you have sexual history with is at this place. Um, there was one situation where a girl that I had some sexual history with, she did some work down in, um, in Atlanta, so she was flying in way before she had asked me to like give her some books or something like that. And I kept that commitment to meet up with her and give her books instead of telling her, like, you know, or just telling her, no, things have changed since the last time. Um, so these are the types of things that I didn't notice until way later that Nail would see or have whatever and have problem with. Of course. Because even if a girl is hitting me up saying, D, you know, my mom loves your stuff. Uh, my, my, my colleague, you know, is a fan of yours. And I reply like, oh, man, thanks. You know what I'm saying? Appreciate that. You know, hope everything is well. Danea sees that at the corner of her eye when she goes to my phone and says, he's talking to women. Yep. So for somebody who hasn't healed, it's triggering all over again. But in my mind, I ain't smashing these women. I'm cur for any woman that I'm even having a loose boundary with, I'm curving women 10 times more. So on into engagement, um, that was the first time I was like, okay, I don't know if I can do this. Because at this point, man, I done got her books. I'm trying to, I got a therapist because she's, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not getting a version of her I think I'm supposed to get. I'm faithful. I'm provisional. Uh, I'm still asking about what we can do to fill up her love tank, but she's hostile. She's cl closed off. At times, she's emasculating with how she talks. Um, of course, the sex is not even close to being there. And then we, she said, well, we need to go to counseling. That's why I'm glad you went right there. And then what happened in counseling? Because that's where she said she revealed, this is before y'all got married, right? And this is where she revealed I had been raped before, right? In this counseling session, that this happened. Uh, when did she mention uh, when did she mention that she has saw stuff in your phone and all that stuff? Was that in this counseling session? Um, this was, no, she already had told me in real life she had saw the stuff, but this is where we're going to deep dive through all those things. And at first I was reluctant. I ain't going to lie to you, man, because it's like, why is the relationship only in trouble when you're unhappy? Why is it that I've been telling you stuff? I'm, I'm not getting what I need. I'm paying for personal trainers to help fix your self-esteem so you can get back in shape. I'm paying for the therapist, the books, the podcast. I'm, I'm doing everything, rubbing feet, backs, everything. And it's not enough. And I'm hurt by that. But then whenever you feel upset, now you're ready to save the relationship. So I was reluctant at first. I ain't going to lie. But I'm like, I'm engaged now. We got a little baby. Um, let's do this. Let's the go to already born at this point? Yeah, Marley's already there. She okay. was there like maybe eight months old. She was very young. And then the counselor, and this was kind of really made it tough for me to continue on, he immediately went into rescuer mode. Danea is a lot better at accessing her emotions, especially painful emotions, than I ever have been. So me and her together, I'm big and I'm, you know, I'm extroverted. I can talk a little bit. She's a soft voice and, you know, just look like she just been held in a basement or something like that. <laughs> so we go in and talking. And immediately she goes in about all the hard things I had done in the previous relationship. So me, ignorant, didn't really, I never considered all the previous, because I'm like, hold on, in between time we yeah. single, you've been dating. Yeah. I'm thinking my, especially because she got her lick back. Yeah. She yeah. got her lick back. And, yeah. and I mean, call me what you want, bro. I still feel to an extent. Once you get your lick back and you even the we score, even. We even. I don't want to, I, I mean, you know yeah. what I'm saying? Like you got, you went in one of the guys and I don't know if she slept with him or nothing like that, but it was one of my homies. She knowingly did this. I did that to make you upset. She went for guitar lessons and learned everything she needed to know in one night. But I was like, okay, well, my chest hurt just like you your chest. learned everything you need to know in one night. But I'm like, you wasn't bad for doing that. Anybody would be first off on timing. Then secondly, to make me, you know what I'm saying? My chest hurt just like hers did. Yeah. All right, cool. So when we in this counseling session, back to here, 2017, she going in. And all me, I'm in the present of all the things I've been doing. It's the first time I've come this hard for the relationship ever. And, you know, financial aspect and the security. I'm the guy down on one knee. It's, I can't do no more than what I've done. But she talking about me like I'm a dog. And the only thing that exists is all the negatives. I ain't done a single positive. Not sac so he not only allowed her to say that, he said, now you, now you got this hard voice with me already. I ain't even said nothing. You don't say a word. Not until y'all come back on another session. So it was tough because I'm like, man, my feelings are obsolete the moment that she talked. And she, can, she crying and everything, so I get it. But I'm like, man, this ain't it for somebody who already deals with shame, wounds, abandonment, all this other stuff. Um, we did do like one more session. And in that time, I found out she was uh, texting a personal trainer under a woman's name. She had uh, been searching them on Facebook. 
Um, she had lied about some other stuff. So after that, bro, and she went and said some things that weren't true in the council. I didn't even want to go no more. You just say, I'm not going. No, because I, I felt like, you know, you're not even approaching this genuinely. And at this point, I was questioning if I wanted to go through with the marriage. I was about to ask you. So y'all still, but you didn't end the engagement. Didn't end anything. The, a big repetitive pattern of I'm pissed. I'm detached. I'm mentally checking out. I'm going to show up as a worse version of myself, but I ain't letting you go. So that's a little bit of ego. It's a little bit of abandonment wounds, whatever you want to call it. We both didn't let each other go, no matter how much we was detaching. That's interesting. I want to I wanna stop uh, part one right here uh, because when we come back, I want to talk about when y'all decide to go through with the marriage and then what happened and what got us here at this point. Mm -hmm. uh, listen, uh, make sure you tune in tomorrow for part two of this. Uh, thank you so much. You've been very vulnerable, being transparent. I, re I you know, I'm over here gauging to see if you're going to be lying and all this stuff. And I said, no, he's been authentic. If he, if he ain't been authentic, you, you're a good liar. Boy, I, I'm, I teach acting and I'm a director. I'm like, if you lying to me, I, I, I just need to go in, back into my mama womb. Because everything you're saying, you, you're, you're 10 toes down in what you're saying and you're being authentic. So thank you for showing up as no, your authentic sure. self. Tune in tomorrow for part two. Ladarian thrusted suddenly into Child Protective Services in 2015. My nephew, black, a boy. The likelihood of being adopted outside of kinship, slim to none. Armani, 16 years old, black, a boy with five years in the foster care system before I even knew his name. The likelihood of ever being adopted? Yep, you guessed it, slim to none. While Ladarian and Armani were trying to survive and barely thrive in an overpopulated and underfunded foster care system, I was living my own life, doing well professionally. Having been a single father with a daughter who at that point was doing well in college, it was my time to live my life, right? Wrong. I felt unsettled, tireless, agitated. There are just too many of our black children stuck in ambiguity and in the limbo of the foster care system. In 2017, I legally adopted my nephew, Ladarian. Fast forward to 2019, I had no ties to this other young king, but I felt God instructed me to adopt him also, and I obeyed. Starting over with parenting should have been enough, right? Working with various foster care and adoption agencies to help bring awareness to the countless young black kings in the foster care system should have decreased my agitation, right? Joining the board of directors of Advantage Adoption, an organization that helps find permanent adoptive homes for children in foster care should have led to some type of resolve, right? No, not at all. None of it felt like I had done enough. I now realize that every one of those experiences was laying the fundamental foundation for my life's mission, Kingdom Royale. Kingdom Royale will be a luxury, state-of-the-art home for foster boys. Our first location will be in the Dallas-Fort Worth Metroplex. We will utilize the whole person approach that instills identity, empowers them to advocate for themselves, and enlightens them regarding new perspectives and limitless options that they thought were impossible. Though the young kings will attend the local public schools that are in proximity to Kingdom Royale, our at-home curriculum will broaden their worldview through participating in the arts, attending various cultural events, learning about and engaging in multifaceted discussions about current events and even relevant historical contexts, introducing them to gardening and landscaping and even caring for our animals on our farm and on-site stables. We just launched our startup capital campaign with the goal of raising $2.8 million. Now, why $2.8 million? Well, in 2017, I created a web series in which I performed random acts of kindness for targeting the homeless community. One of the most notable successes was that one of the videos went viral, garnering 28 million views. However, one of my biggest regrets is that I didn't raise a single dollar to help in implementing a more sustainable plan for the homeless community. So throughout the years, with much remorse. I reflected on not maximizing that moment. I knew if at that time, just 10% of the viewers donated $1, we would have raised at least $2.8 million that could have really established long-term support for the homeless community, or at least started a long-term initiative to do so. This is my do-over. 
This is our new beginning. Together, we can attack this at the root by specifically helping our homeless black boys who are already disproportionately represented in the American foster care system. I'm LaTeris R. Whitfield. I've been nominated for three regional Emmys documenting my work with the homeless as well as my personal adoption journey. Despite those accolades, the greatest award for me is truly providing the infrastructure for a transformed life. Visit KingdomRoyale.com for more details. Crown a king and make a donation today.